All right, uh, let's see. Can I get somebody in the... Emery, can you, can you pop those, or Daniel, can you pop those two lights, please, in the center? There we go, perfect. All right, well, we're continuing our class on a defense for our hope. We've already shown, without a shadow of a doubt, that Christianity is absolutely true. Now we're asking the question, is Christianity absolutely good? And we've been exploring some of that with questions like, is it good for society? And we've seen that it's actually great for society. And that Christianity is still good, and it is still great, despite all of the evil and the pain and the suffering that we see in this world. And it gives us really the most robust answer for the evil and suffering in this world. It not only gives us the intellectual answers, it also gives us the emotional comfort to help us endure the suffering when we go through it, and ultimately the joyful hope of knowing God is working all things together for good, uh, for those who love Him, and leading to the restoration of all things where we can finally live with God in an evil-free, pain-free world. Well, tonight we're going to answer the question, does Christianity denigrate women and non-white people? And we'll kind of do the class in two halves, and we'll spend the first half on the women, and then the last half on that second question. Here is my question, and again, I apologize for not getting these to you sooner. I'm filling in, you might notice, for Tim, uh, and so it's just it's extra work on me. It's very difficult to get questions ahead of time because it means I have to actually be ready for my class before the last class, which is almost impossible. All right, so we'll do our best. Why do you think some people believe that Christianity demeans or denigrates women? And actually, I forgot to pray. Let's do that first, <laughs> and then we'll answer the question. Uh, Father in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you so much for this midweek break. We can come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It breaks our hearts, Lord, that you are so misunderstood by our culture and so misrepresented by people who claim to be living for you but aren't. And we pray, Father, for patience with those around us, for understanding, to, to try to step into their shoes and, and see why they might think the way that they do and why they might be so against Christianity and help us to not get defensive or angry, uh, Lord, but to be loving and patient and try to see things from their perspective, but then also help us to know the truth, help us to understand that Christianity truly is good and there is nothing better than Christ. Help us as we study this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, why do you think some people believe Christianity demeans or denigrates women? Mike's got one up front. <clears throat> do we still just have the one? Okay. So we've got one mic runner. We might need a, okay, Terry's, Terry's hopping up to be the second. All right, go ahead, Mike. If you were to walk in off the street and you had no exposure to Christianity into our church, you would see that women are not allowed to say prayers, they're not allowed to teach, they're not allowed to preach, mm. they can't be elders. So it's not denigration, it's their perception of lack of equality, because our yes. society is all about equality across the board. Yes. And that in the church, the way it's been laid out, is not equal in the eyes of the world. Yes, good point, right? The differing roles of women, in particular with public worship and preaching and being elders and all of that in the assembly, yeah, that's, that's different and that's very offensive. Makes women feel inferior. All right, Gail has one. I think when you're talking about in the home, um, you see that the, the husband has the headship Mm. And that's very offensive to people in the world because they, uh, they believe, you know, that they should be allowed to pretty much be their own person and do whatever they want to do. Okay, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this idea of a wife needing to submit to her husband, just that word submission is just like, ah, because it, it brings up slavery connotations, right? It's like, oh, the wife's a slave. You know, the, the, the husband is the boss, and he just bosses his wife around, and she's got to do what, he's gotta, uh, what, what he says. It, it, it might make women feel like they're just too dumb, and they can't make any decisions for themselves, so they, they need their husband to make all the decisions for them. Or, or women are just too, you know, helpless, and they can't do anything, and they, they need their husband to just do everything for them, right? So, so you can see how people might interpret that and think, oh, man, that, yeah, that submission, I mean, that's, that sounds awful. Matt had one? <clears throat> I 
we also have to acknowledge, as we've done in other topics, that in the past people have used Christianity to denigrate women. So yes. they have taken those stances exactly. that women just need to be quiet and sit down. And mm -hmm. so that has been used and abused in the past, and we have to deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like when we talked about, is Christianity good for society? And we said, why do people think it's bad for society? Well, because there have been so many abuses of Christianity. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, in the 50s, I mean, it's, that's kind of the classic, right? The trad wife is what they call it now, the traditional wife, where the husband, you know, he would just go off to work and she would stay home. And, uh, you know, he was basically just bossing her around and she was like a servant of his. Uh, somebody was telling me, and it's really sad, but I'm smiling because it's, it's so sad that it's humorous. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, there was a Christian man. He was an older, older guy. I think he's passed away by now. But anyway, he, he would just like raise his tea glass and just shake his glass mm -hmm. with the expectation that his wife would come running mm -hmm. like a waitress, like a personal slave, right? And refill his glass. And it's like, that's not the picture of Christianity. <laughs> that's not what submission and headship is all about at all. Okay. So if anything, it's the opposite picture of that. All right, Herb. So two things, keying off first of what Matt said, uh, traditionally, <clears throat> world cultures worldwide have always seen women as less than men. And all we have to do is point to the fact that they were not allowed to vote until, I don't know, was it 1920? I don't even know when, sometime in there. So, so but even going back hundreds of years, it's always been that way. Mm. So I think they equate that, sort of blame the church with that, mm. when it wasn't the church's fault, but mm. nonetheless. And then keying off of what Gail said, uh, and I'm sure she meant this as well, but not only is man the head, but uh, the Bible teaches that, that the two are not equal in terms of responsibility for the family. Mm. And there's no choice. It's not something to be argued. And, and the women who, who acclaim demeaning and denigration just can't accept that there's nothing to discuss. It's not negotiable. Mm -hmm. And it's just really hard to, to, you know, for some people to wrap their heads around it. Yeah. Yeah, those are all really good thoughts. Yeah, you also, I also think, if you have other answers, you can raise your hand. Um, I, I also think about the restrictions that the Bible puts on the lives of women in terms of their behavior, like not having multiple sexual partners. And that's especially sensitive after the sexual revolution, right? And to think that, that women can be told by some religion, right, how to live her life, the abortion issue, that's a huge thing. How's God, you know, how, how's God gonna tell me what to do with my own body? Uh, that, that can be a very sensitive thing for them, sort of an affront to their freedom and their autonomy. Um, some might think, hey, the scriptures are, they're all written by men. So, of course, you know, none of the women wrote the scriptures, so of course the men are gonna, have a religion that's going to favor them and give them the advantage and, and maybe even denigrate women in the process. Um, maybe, some, maybe some think that there's an inordinate blame put on Eve right, for the curse of, of sin in the world, um, which again, a lot of these are just kind of misperceptions because it's actually it's, it's Adam who's held responsible mostly in the Bible for, for the sin in the world because he was supposed to be the leader there in that situation, and he failed. Okay, but you could kind of see, I just, I'm just saying, let's put ourselves in people's shoes. Let's not just say, oh, you know, you just hate God. What's your problem? It's like, well, no, <laughs> there are some legitimate things. If you've never really read the whole Bible, right, and you're just hearing these verses and you got a TikTok account, right, and you just, you're hearing these people who are teenagers and who profess to be theologians, right, and they're just like, what is what the Bible says? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to walk away thinking, man, yeah, the Bible's terrible. God, God must hate women or something. And I just want us to see that that's not true. So, uh, so here are going to be, here's my question that will spend, whoops, I'm sorry. What, what happened there? Uh, okay, I must have messed the animation up. Okay, here's my question. It's not going to be on the screen. Ugh. In what ways does the Bible, both Old and New Testament, actually honor and elevate women? In what ways does the Bible... You can use Old Testament, New Testament, either one, actually honor and elevate women. Uh, let me give you three to start with. I think there's a lot of answers here, okay? But let me just give you three to start, and this will help you because I couldn't send these to you ahead of time. This will help you 
get your wheels turning and start thinking about this. Uh, number one, women are images of God and co-rulers of the world. Okay, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, the cattle, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So all the times when it mentions man, it, it, it's saying mankind. It's saying humans. And notice God doesn't say only man. Only males are made in my image. That's not what that says. Both male and female are made in God's image. The essence of God could not be fully reflected just by the male. If it was just men walking around, it would not be an accurate reflection of God's character. It would be 50% of God's character. Well, I don't know if you can put a percentage on it, but uh, you need to have women as well in order to accurately reflect the fullness of what God is like in his character in this world. Um, so already, if you think about it, on page one of Genesis, women are proven to have inherent worth and value far above all the rest of creation and an equal value to man because they're both made in the image of God. It's not that man is made more in the image of God than women, and God is more of a man than a woman, though obviously God does represent himself in Scripture as a man primarily. There's a lot of allusions to him having characteristics of a mother uh, as well. She was created out of man, that's true. But it doesn't mean that she has any less value or worth or dignity than man. One writer said she was taken out of man's side, not from man's foot. <laughs> okay, so she's not meant to be trampled on by men. She's meant to come alongside him. And he has his arm around her, and they are, they are co-rulers in the world. They're, they're, they are both given dominion over creation in, in an equal sense. Okay? They may not have the same roles in their household and things like that, but, or, or even in the church, but in terms of their dominion over creation and their rulership, they are both in God's image. All right, secondly, uh, helper doesn't mean slave. Slave, helper doesn't mean slave. Genesis 2.18, Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable to him. When we hear that word helper in our society, it's just like, oh, she's in an apron. She's chained to the kitchen sink doing dishes the rest of her life, right? She's doing laundry. That, that's what God knew. Like man needed someone to pick up his socks. Like that's why he created women, right? No, that's not what that verse means, okay? Because helper is a word ezer in Hebrew, and it's the same word used of God himself over 15 times in the Old Testament. So here's an, a good example. Psalm 70, verse 5, I am afflicted and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help or my ezer and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Uh, maybe the point of Genesis is to say that men would be terribly afflicted and needy, okay, without... Women, like they, men need the help of a woman. And, and not just in the sexual sense of being able to bear children and experience sexual pleasure, but because a woman's emotional constitution balances the man out, helps him be more relational and centered. She is a great source of encouragement to lift him up um, and even maybe save himself from his own bullheadedness at times. So even on page two of the Bible, women are pictured as needed by men the way humanity needs God. That's, that's a pretty strong need. Now, this is not saying anything about, you know, single people. And, you know, if, you, if you're a single person and you don't have a woman, well, then you're, you're just going to be afflicted your whole life. That, that's not the point. The point is just God didn't want men only walking around. Okay, he, he wants men and women. Women are um, valuable. I don't like the word invaluable. It's just, it's such a weird word because it makes it sound like they're not valuable. They are. <laughs> they are invaluable. Invaluable and valuable mean the same, and that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, moving on. I just, I wanted to be clear for those listening on the recording. If I said women are invaluable, they'd be like, see, he just said it. He said women don't, don't have value. Uh, all right, uh, number three here, God used women to save the world. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity, he's talking to Eve here between you, or excuse me, he's talking to Satan here, uh, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. God's plan was to use Eve and her seed to defeat Satan one day. And of course, that was fulfilled in Jesus, who was born not of a man, 
but of a woman, Mary. So already on pages 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis, we see that women are elevated to the absolute highest position possible, and they have incalculable worth to God and to all of humanity. There is no religion that even comes close to elevating women's value and worth like this. And we're only, I only gave you three, and we're going to keep going. So what do you guys have for this question? Uh, again, it's not on the screen, so in what ways does the Bible, both Old and New Testament, actually honor and elevate women. You can use Old Testament example, New Testament example, however you want. Go ahead, Herb. Um, Eve has become the mother of all creation. She, he crowned her with the gift to, to give birth to new life. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty important. It was important for me that my mother <laughs> was able to do that so mm -hmm. all of us wouldn't be here. So. I, I consider that a pretty valuable myself. Absolutely. Not invaluable, but very valuable. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's just <laughs> not inconceivable, but conceivable. See? See? You start applying it to other things, and it, it, the rules break down. There's no rules in English. It's terrible. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and how sad is it, right, that our culture, women in our culture, view pregnancy as such a burden. Just, oh, it's the worst, you know? And it's like, no, that's an incredible gift that God has given you. That is an incredible responsibility uh, and privilege and honor to be able to bring life into this world. That is an amazing thing. All right, Gail? I was thinking of Jesus and how he treated his mother. Um, even mm. when he was on the cross, he made sure he took care of her, mm. which was a very big sign of love that he had for her. And yeah. I had another one about yeah. how he treated um, the woman at the well and yeah. also the woman caught in adultery, he didn't you know, go yeah. after her. She wasn't the only guilty party, mm -hmm. but he addressed her sin and then told her to go and sin no more. Yeah, I mean, think about all the women Jesus helped and healed, right? He helps the adulterous woman by showing her mercy. He helps his mother by you know, having John watch out for her while he's gone. He spoke to the woman at the well, which nobody would ever do that. Like a man just speaking to a woman like that out in public, like that, that's just kind of a weird thing. And it was even more weird because he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan and Jews and Samaritans have no dealings with each other. But he broke through that barrier because he loved her so much and wanted to offer her living water. Um, he healed women like Peter's mother-in-law, uh, the woman with the flow of blood. He helped raise a poor widow's son from the dead, the widow of, at Nain. Uh, he healed a lady who had bent been bent over double with back problems for 18 years. He raised Jairus's like little girl, little daughter from the dead. Um, and as he did so, he, he would often refer to girls with endearing terms like daughter. Uh, so yeah, that, that's really good. Jesus's relationship with women. Yeah, Joe. Uh, and you also see stories uh, uh, in, in the Bible that, that that elevates women. I mean, look at Esther. She saved her people. Okay, uh, yeah. You look at Rahab, who who societally, societally was real low, but I mean, look at the great things that she did. I mean, mm -hmm. with the spies and stuff. So th there's all kinds of it, to me, encouragement for women. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he uses Esther to save the entire you know, Jewish race at that time. Uh, and then, yeah, he's, God is using prostitutes even, like Rahab, right? And, and including her in the lineage of the Messiah, like allowing Jesus to actually come through Rahab, giving her that honor to actually be included in the descendancy of Jesus. Yeah, Terry? Uh, when Abram was renamed Abraham, Sarai was also renamed Sarah, which translated means princess. Hmm. So okay. God, God bestowed upon her royalty. Uh, at the same time that he bestowed the gift of mm. Abraham's name as well. Okay, yeah, good point. So it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to elevate Abraham over here, but I'm not going to care you know, about his wife. Yeah, God elevates Sarah as well, gives her an amazing role in this plan to bring Isaac the son of promise. Yeah. Debbie? And I think about all the women who followed Jesus. And, mm, yes. You know, like... Lydia, and then all the women that came to his grave. It wasn't a flock of men that came to, mm. to treat his body with respect and take him you know, off mm. the cross and bury him. Mm -hmm. It was the women. Yeah. And they were the first ones to go and see him. So Good he point. had large followings of women. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't treated special and kindly by him, they wouldn't have been doing that. 
Yeah, really good. I mean, think how good of friends he was with Mary and Martha, right? And, and her, their brother Lazarus and, and Bethany. Bethany seemed like it was sort of like a, like a safe haven for Jesus, like sort of get away, go, you know, go be, be with his friends. And he even, you know, people mention how women just were not allowed really to be educated in, in the first century world. And yet Jesus, he's letting Mary sit at his feet. And Mary says, you know, remember Martha's in the kitchen. She's trying to get all this stuff done. And Jesus says, she's chosen the better thing, and that is to learn from me. And Jesus, he invites Mary to do that, to, to, to actually be educated from a Jewish rabbi on a personal one-to-one -one level. That, that's pretty rare for Jews to do that. Jews look down on women, too. It's really sad. They misunderstood the Old Testament, clearly. But many of the Jews would wake up and, and pray, you know, God, I thank you that you did not make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Uh, many of the Jews, some of the Jews said that they sort of refused to teach women the law uh, because they would just go and, you know, break it in sin. And <laughs> so, so the Jews had a really bad view of women, too, not just the Gentiles. And now here's Jesus, a Jew, and look how he's treating these women. He doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, I'm not teaching you, Mary. You're not worthy of the law. You're a woman. Get out of here. No, he's absolutely teaching her. Yeah. Yeah, um, and beyond just being educated, the women that were going out and educating Others, um, mm. Priscilla and Aquila, who Priscilla yeah. was actively out teaching mm -hmm. um, others about Jesus as well. So not only yes. was she knowledgeable in it, she was sharing that, and you know that was important enough work to be noted by name. Really uh, good in the Bible. And I think every single time that couple is mentioned, her name is first. Just an interesting thought. I don't know what that means necessarily, but I do find it interesting in a world that was totally you know, misogynistic against women and totally denigrated women, for the New Testament to put her name first uh, in that couple is, is really powerful. Also, along, along that line, um, Romans 16, Paul mentions like nine women who have been indispensable in his, not dispensable, indispensable, <laughs> in his ministry. In other words, like these women were very valuable to Paul in working together with him in the kingdom and you know, God does place limits in terms of like women being up in the assembly preaching and stuff like that. But, but personally, there were prophetesses and there were people like Aquila and Priscilla taking Apollos aside. God using women to teach people the gospel on a personal level. Absolutely, that was going on. Yeah, Herb? Did somebody already mention the seller of purple, the lady that had the Bible study? And... Um, well, Debbie, briefly, but yeah, yeah. Lydia. Right? I mean, she was, she was like <laughs> the primary teacher for that group. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if you think about it, that's Acts 16 when, fall per, when Paul first comes to Europe. And what does he do? He goes to a group of women, mm -hmm. and he teaches them down by the river. Presumably, it's because there was, there was no Jewish synagogue in the area. You needed a certain number of men in order to form a synagogue. And if they didn't have enough Jewish men, then, then the women would just kind of get together and, and pray somewhere. So Paul, he goes down to the river where the women are praying, and he teaches them the gospel. Lydia and her household, they're the first ones converted on his second missionary journey to Europe. That, that's just incredible. He could have said, there's no men here, I'm out of here. No, he didn't do that. He went and he taught the women because they, they need the gospel too. They're just as valuable to God. Yeah, Dave? Ephesians 5, 25, 29. Okay. Husbands love your wives. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that, that you know, they, it, Christ gave up his life to the church, gave himself up for her. It yes. means take out the trash, fellas. Come on. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. If God tells you to die for your wife, you can take out the trash. Right? You, can, you can fill up her tea glass right, when she needs it. Okay? Um, yeah, you bring up an interesting point that God's laws, they always were designed to protect women. And what I find fascinating, it's kind of sad and tragic, is that the so many of the verses that our culture finds absolutely repulsive because they're so degrading to women, the first century world found those same verses repulsive, repulsive for the opposite reason, that they were too elevating of women. Even the Ephesians 5 thing, are you kidding me? You think a Roman man would die for his wife? No. Patria protesta, I think was the name, the Latin name for the idea that the that the man has complete control and dominance over his household and dominance over his wife, dominance to abuse her, whatever he wants to do. And by the way, he can go and have concubines on the side too. And that's totally fine. And Christianity comes along and says, actually, you need to die for your wife like Christ died for you on the cross. That, that's insane. I mean, that is like the most insane thing in, in the world, like in the first century world. 
That, that's incredible. Um, and not only that, but, but Christianity is saying you can only have one wife and you must be 100% faithful to her and you cannot be having sex with other people while you're married. Um, one, one woman noted how unfortunate it is that the, that the verse about wives submitting to husbands has led to so many husbands abusing their wives. Okay? But she, she ponders this question. She says, what if the command to wives was, wives love your husbands to the point of death, putting his needs above yours and sacrificing yourself for him? She said, that, that sounds way worse. Like, that would be a way bigger catalyst for husbands to abuse their wives if that was the role of wives. Yet God is giving this command to husbands. That's, that's really powerful. It leaves zero room for a husband thinking his role is to abuse his wife or to raise his D-glass, and she just hops to it. Um, Dave. Yeah, I was just thinking of Martha. Um, you know, they had, they had asked for Jesus to come because uh, her brother was, was very ill, mm. Lazarus, and he delayed. And so when he finally does come, he meets with her first. And it's almost like a challenge. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But her relationship with him in that culture that you talk about was such that she could say something like that yeah. you know, yeah. to another man. Yeah. And that was unheard of. Women were property at the time. Sure. I mean, yeah, there was this closeness between them. It was really remarkable. Um, continuing along the lines of God's laws protecting women, even in the Old Testament, right? God says if, you, if you're a man and you rape a woman, you're dead. Death penalty. Boom. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy 24, giving a woman a certificate of divorce. The idea of that certificate was to protect her because it gave her permission to remarry, and then it prevented you from changing your mind and going and taking her back from her new husband, which they would do, you know, in that culture. And God says, no, 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 that certificate of divorce, that's going to keep you from, from trying to bounce her back and forth between men. Um, Jesus saying in the New Testament that if you divorce a wife for any reason and marry someone else, you commit adultery against her. You're committing adultery against your, your wife. Okay, he care, Jesus cares about her. 1 Corinthians 7. Again, another absolutely insane verse. That the husband does not have authority over his own body. The wife does. And the wife doesn't have authority over her own body. The husband does. You both need to fulfill each other's needs sexually. I mean, that is, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, the, the husband would see his wife as existing to fulfill his needs sexually. But there would be no, like, sensitivity of the husband thinking like, I wonder if I'm meeting her sexual needs. Like <laughs> that was not how they thought, but Christianity changed that and said, yes, you absolutely need to think about that as a husband. And I know Peter calls women weaker vessels in 1 Peter 3, 7, uh, and that's so repulsive to us, but he doesn't mean she's inferior or less valuable. It means that she's like a piece of fine china to be handled with care. She's not, I've used this illustration before, she's not a hard-shelled sippy cup that you can just toss around and you can just drop on the floor and she'll be fine. You know? No, she, she, when it says weaker, it means, it means fragile. It means you're, you're caring for her with a more tender hand. And in that same verse, he says to show her honor. And if you don't, God won't hear your prayers. That's how important women are. If husbands, you mistreat your wife, God says, I won't even hear your prayers. I'll close my ears. Uh, okay, Gail and then John, then we got to move on. I think it's uh, amazing that some of this um, treatment of women, um, you would think it's, it should have gone away a long time ago, but it's still been perpetuated. I, mm. I know growing up in the church in the 60s and 70s, mm. I saw men in the church that would yell and scream at their wife and yeah. they didn't care if people saw it and they would do worse things behind closed doors. And yeah. I, I think that's why it's so important about the verses that he quoted yeah. about, you know, if we do the roles that God intended for us to do, our marriage will be happy, um, but we have to look at ourselves and what we're doing. Yeah, amen. Yep, that's not how Jesus treats us. We are his bride. We are Jesus' wife in the church. He would never treat us that way. John? Um, regarding the, the weaker vessel, I, I guess this is the way that I look at this. Um, yes, you are correct, and I agree with that. I think is because of men, we could be looked at as like rough-hewn, nasty clay pots because we can be gruff, mm -hmm. we can be hard, Sure. And, you know, and kind of dismissive yep. sometimes. Yep. And typically women, 
usually take a little bit more of a gentle approach um, and a more of a caring approach when it comes to more of, of uh, sensitive um, mm -hmm. issues, sure. so to speak, or spiritual issues. Absolutely. You know, they're going to be a little bit more calmer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that's, that's kind of how I read that. Yeah. So absolutely. you in, you know, you treat them that way yep and see you know instead of like you say throwing them around like a paper plate yeah know. don't be a bull in a china shop right <laughs> your wife is the china you're the bull and yeah don't don't just um be be rough and indiscriminate in how you act um luke 8 many women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses mary who was called magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out joanna the wife of chusa herod's steward and susanna many others were contributed to jesus and his disciples uh, support out of their private means. Okay, so they're, they're helping to financially support Jesus. Um, women were the first eyewitnesses to the empty tomb, which again, in the ancient world, women were not trustworthy witnesses. So the fact that the New Testament would actually use them as the witnesses shows that the New Testament believes women are trustworthy. <laughs> they're, they're not buying into the cultural false belief uh, that women can't be trusted. All right, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, Neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female, female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So our worth, our value, it comes from Jesus, uh, and, and we have equal value. Now, we, again, we have different roles in God's kingdom, and um, men are called to be leaders in marriage. Women are card, called to follow, but that difference has nothing to do with her worth or her value. Part of the curse for Eve's sin, sadly, is that women will not like that submissive role, and that women will actually fight against that, which is what we're dealing with today. It's why sometimes women are so offended by, you know, that submission word in, in Ephesians 5. But I think God gives us our roles for our good because it's the role that most strengthens our character. Um, you know, because maybe of the curse of sin, I'm not sure, but because women want control, God forces them to give it up to the men. And men a lot of times want to give up control. And so God says, well, be a man and be a leader anyway, even though you want to give it up. And if men do want the control, God says, you got to give that up to Christ anyway. So, so everybody's being submissive. Nobody likes submission. We all have to be submissive in some way or another. But Christianity makes it so much easier for women to submit to men who love them, honor them, cherish them, sacrifice for them, treat them like fine china. That's what Christ commands men to do. And I'll just make this one last note here. The laws that God gives women about how to live which they might view as oppressive today, are, are actually for their good. Like, we're just finding that the feminist movement, the whole women, women's liberation, sexual freedom, all that stuff, it's just making miserable women, essentially, from a statistical perspective. There may be some outliers here that really enjoy that, you know, claim to be super happy living that way. Uh, but for the most part, that's just not how women are designed, and God knew that. So as much as we might fight against the roles, um, God knows this is actually what's best for both men and women. All right, so for the rest of our time, I wanna explore the idea that Christianity is the white man's religion, and it's all about propagating whiteness. Now, because of the cancerous poison of critical race theory, uh, we live in a country that has made up the term whiteness to describe the imposed standards and norms of white people on the rest of society with the implication that non-white standards are inferior. And just as a side note, this is one of the myriad examples of how critical race theory just makes people racist in the opposite direction. I've done a whole class on critical theory. You can find it online in more detail on that. But can you imagine if I got up here in, in the reverse and said, we really need to deal with the problem of blackness in society? I mean, ooh, that would be awful. But our culture feels just fine talking about the evils of whiteness and how terrible you know, the white people are. And they do it openly with no fear of consequence whatsoever. Um, sadly, some today believe that built into Christianity is the promulgation of a white dominant culture. They view evangelism, and especially foreign missions, as an act of white colonization, where white Americans and European Christians try to take control of indigenous peoples and force their standards and norms on those societies. Now again, we try to put ourselves in their shoes, see possibly where they could be coming from. Um, maybe three reasons. First of all, throughout history, when Europeans colonized other lands, they would often bring their Christian beliefs with them. And so you can see how the line between evangelism and conquering a territory right, could, could get a little blurred in the, in the minds of some. 
Uh, secondly, uh, many classic depictions in art portray Jesus as a white guy with blue eyes, right? And that seemed to be like the dominant narrative for hundreds of years, right? That Jesus, was, he was a white guy. And then thirdly, sadly, many, and this is true, many white slave owners in America wrongly used the Bible to justify their practices. So you can see how black people might hold the Bible in contempt as a way to keep white people in power over them. So again, you can, you can sort of see and, and be sensitive to where people are coming from on those things. Uh, but here's, here's my last question. How can we know from the Bible that Christianity is not the white man's religion? <laughs> What do you think? All right, Phil, uh, make, let's, let's make our answers brief and concise because we only have four minutes left. See how many we can get in. Yeah, Phil? Uh, the gospel is for all people, for all nations, for all time. Okay, yeah, Jesus said go into all nations. He didn't say go into the white nations. <laughs> yeah. Go into all nations, Jared. That's kind of what I was going to get out. The Great Commission is uh, go into all the world and teach to every creature. There you go. Joe? Everybody comes from Adam. There you go. We're all the same race. Racism is not a thing. Because we're not all different races. We're one race. We're human beings. Now, we form different tribes. Tribalism is a thing, okay? But, yeah, we're, we're all one race. We all come from Adam. So there's absolutely no superiority just because you look different, just because your skin is a different pigmentation. You have no superiority over, over me. I have no inferiority below you because we all come to the same place. Terry? Uh, two words, Ethiopian eunuch. All right, there you go, right? Ethiopian eunuch. Philip on the road to... Uh, Mm, I almost said Damascus, that's Paul. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Philip, Acts 8. Uh, I can't remember, where was Philip going? Anyway, I'll have to look that up later. But he runs across the Ethiopian eunuch, and he doesn't say, oh, this is the black guy. You know, I'm not teaching him the gospel, forget that. No, he says, hey, don't you understand Isaiah 53, what you're reading? And he does, and he baptizes him. Absolutely. Um, Abraham, right, he's the founder of the faith, really. He's, he's nicknamed the father of the faith. He was from Mesopotamia, which is in modern Iraq. Okay? He was not a white European man. Moses was born in Egypt, which is in Africa. And God's people were brought out of Africa after being in the land of Canaan for centuries before then. Uh, there's some debate over whether Egypt should be considered African or Middle Eastern, since it was influenced by both, but it's definitely not white, okay? Uh, Moses married a Cushite woman, who were sometimes referred to as Ethiopians. Solomon's lover in, this, in the, the book, Song of Solomon, was a black woman, okay? She talks about her, her black skin in that book. Um, the first Christians were from all over the globe. In Acts chapter 2, when the church was first established, all these different locations this is, this is where people came from to hear the gospel for the very first time. 3,000 people were baptized that day, most of them not white. In fact, there's, there's almost no white people in the Bible. <laughs> like, you, you really don't even run into white people, maybe until Paul goes on his second missionary journey to Europe, and, and maybe he's running into some there. But boy, it, you just really don't find too many white people in the Bible. And just put that together again with Galatians 3, 28, which we read earlier. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, right? Slave or free, we're, we're all one in Christ. It doesn't matter what you look like. Our identity comes from Him. And then maybe one more thing to add here. Evangelism in the Bible, it is not colonization. <laughs> okay? Evangelism, evangelism is, wow, I can't talk. Evangelism is not about going and stealing someone's land and saying, we're taking control, and by the way, you need to believe in Jesus or we're going to murder you. Like, no, that, that's not what's happening there. Okay, we're offering people the gospel. It's their free will choice to receive it. We're planting seeds. It's working in people's hearts. If they reject it, so be it. We're not forcing anybody uh, to believe. Um, let's see. Christianity, let me finish this way. Christianity does not elevate white people above everybody else, nor does it denigrate white people and label them guiltier than every other race like critical race theory does. We're all sinners, deserving of God's wrath, yet by grace we can be saved through Christ, no matter what we look like, no matter who we descended from. That'll do it for this class. Uh, and, uh, there's still 30 seconds left, but that's okay. We can, we can call it, and then we'll pick up on Sunday with what topic I can't remember. So. <laughs>